I'm not doing it. Avatar Legends is a tabletop RPG using the Powered by the Apocalypse game engine set in the world of Avatar The Last Airbender, a cartoon series that ran from 2005 to 2008, and The Legend of Korra, a series that limped from 2012 to 2014. Subsequently expanded in a number of comics volumes, these series have been praised for being fun, exciting, well-told, continuity-driven martial arts stories for kids, inclusive and interesting, and also criticised as not being as good as that first one I watched when I was 12. And they are fun, and now we have a role-playing game to continue having different kinds of fun in this world of hybrid creatures, elemental martial arts, steampunk mecha, and extra-dimensional spirituality. Up front, some disclaimers. First, I backed this game on Kickstarter. I did so because I like the show it's from. No great explanation there. Second, the Kickstarter for this game was for $10 million. So we're just going to want to keep that in mind. Third, I have no intention of addressing how good a job this game does at representing the Asian and indigenous cultures it uses as inspiration. Because what would I know about that? And how good a job could I possibly do discussing it? Also, when discussing Powered by the Apocalypse, I have an expertise gap. I don't know Powered by the Apocalypse as a game. I am aware of it, but I've never had the opportunity to play in it. If you're particularly of a mind to dislike this game, I have now offered you your rhetorical trapdoor. After all, every good thing this game is doing, you can attribute to PBTA and not to the game product Avatar Legends. You can then make those arguments in my comment section for the engagement, and I, someone non-expert in the game, will have nothing to say in response to that except an enthusiastic variant on, way to go, sport. Instead, I'm going to present what I know of PBTA from this book and this book alone. If you're the kind of person who starts with the dice, it's a 2d6 system. You're rolling dice trying to hit a fixed success or failure threshold. 7 for partial successes, 10 plus for great successes. You're adding to this a small number of modest bonuses based on what you're dealing with. Circumstances, abilities that are relevant to it, that kind of thing. These total up never more than a plus 4 or a minus 3, which means your range is about 7 on a pair of dice that average about 7. You get these bonuses by activating from basic categories of powers. In this case, your creativity, your focus, your harmony, and your passion. Players don't have powers in the way that you might think of them like spells or activated abilities from things like mutants. They have moves, actions that represent how their character approaches the world. There is a set of basic moves that everyone can use, which include things like assess the situation and calm someone down. And then there are character specific ones that are more tuned to your particular character in your particular variant of PBTA. These can be special interactions that rely on a role, or they could happen automatically, and how they're named is a really powerful tool for setting the tone of how that thing is meant to be used and when. Rather than track hit points, the game gives you a building consequence called fatigue, and a handful of standard conditions they represent the character becoming worn out or losing options for what they can do in a scene. These include stuff like being afraid, which makes you worse at threatening people or calling them out. You get rid of these conditions by doing something that gives in to them or by resting. So if you're afraid, you might run away, and that means you lose the afraid condition. This means that negative conditions are rarely going to stack up unless you're really having a lot of stuff happen to a character in a short period of time, and the consequences of giving in to them tend to remove you from the sequence, rather than represent a character dying. The result is the system looks like it's very mindful of the ways it's being used to construct a story. That works really well for the system because everything is discussed in terms of this conversation. Things within a scene often don't need to be tracked, but the results of scenes do. I like that. There's also a conversation included about how the story works only if people trust everyone is sticking to the same narrative. Less, the DM is the arbiter of the plot, and more, everyone is involved in remembering this story. This also means that the conversation wants to be playing fair with the players. The storyteller of the game can't just pull things out of nowhere without making everyone feel like what they're remembering and holding together together isn't really working. Character building in the system is approached in terms of an archetype's role in a story. Many games, games I'm used to, approach characters as either entirely freeform and defined by what capacities they choose to have, like a point-based system, or they look at characters in terms of the kinds of things they could do, 
barbarians tending to be strong and tough, for example, and floromancers have studied the ways of flowers. Instead of looking at how you do things, this system wants you to consider the character's role in a more analytical model of the story. After all, you might have two characters who look and behave extremely similar within a story, like the Bash Brothers from vitally important sports media The Mighty Ducks 2. But those two characters may be mostly the same kind of heavy-hitting bruiser type, with completely different roles in the story based on when they started and when they leave. That's what I've been able to understand about PBTA as a whole from this book. And if that's mostly correct, then yeah, this book is doing a good job of conveying this system as a whole. What of this book, though? First things first, this book looks very nice. The layout is very clean. There is a good use of graphics and visual motif. Banners and bars are used separately to make sure that certain sub-conversations stand out and are easily contained. The art is very appropriate to the tone of each section. It looks like the show. And, I mean, obviously, of course, it would. You wouldn't want the tie-in to look wildly different. The explainer of role-playing as a system that it starts with is time-bound. It doesn't try and talk about these topics in an arch way. It's willing to mention little kid games like Let's Pretend, stuff that other game systems are occasionally shy about mentioning because, you know, come on, it's a, it's a serious role-playing game with roots in theatre. By being time-bound, it uses a standard tense for all the examples. This is one of those small things that means an editor has probably spent a lot of time correcting a lot of examples and making them cohere, because tense gets away from you easily. Starting at page 15, there's an extensive history of the four eras of the world across the four countries in the world, which feels a lot to me like the two and a half countries in the world, but well, yeah. This runs through the major conflicts across each era, major characters, and the current public view of the Avatar. That culminates in the beginning of character creation at page 107. And that just explains the basic of how moves works. And then at page 163, we start talking about your playbooks. I bollocked Exalted for exactly this kind of thing, and... Avatar being better written in general does not make it an exception. I don't like these playbooks being here. Now, there is a possibility in the physical copy of the book that positioning them here as close to the center of the book as they are means that when you flip open the book naturally, you're going to wind up square in the playbook section, which is kind of going to be one of the most referenced parts of the game early on for the majority of players. I can see a material consideration for that, but I still don't like it. See, the thing is, playbooks are a great way to give people the tools that let them frame their relationship to the world. In other games, there is an on-ramp created by having the character creation as quick as possible. You give people an elevator pitch version of the setting, and then say, and now you know the very basics, here, make something in this setting that's already yours, don't have to commit to anything yet, but just have the start of, oh, I like this and I might like this, stick them together and go. The result is that you wind up seeing everything after that point in terms of how it relates to the thing you have already in this world. Dislike it or you like, but simple class race based character combinations is a way to get people involved really quickly. And in this case, the History of the world is really relevant to your character building. It is part of how you relate to the world. It's just, I would have preferred it to start with the playbooks instead of have all the world history, then the playbooks, then you probably go back to relook at the world history in terms of which playbooks you like. Basically, this is annoying because it's relevant, but it's not relevant yet. From the character creation section, we have a thorough description of ways that characters can progress with a system of experience that is about answering sets of questions and how to change your playbook and ways to specialize your bending. After that, there are three chapters of Game Master Guide stuff, which cover running the game in a short-term, immediate scene-to-scene style stuff, how to structure a longer campaign, 
And then how to structure an adventure, complete with an example adventure. The book then wraps up with uh, appendices showing you techniques for bending, some NPCs, and play material like character sheets. As a book, it is cool. It is nicely produced. It is well laid out. It is thoroughly edited. It has a good but not exhaustive index, and it has a table of contents that makes finding what you want relatively easy. What I want to focus on is your character. Everyone who plays this game is going to need to know how characters work, and for most players, knowing how to make your character is going to be the most mechanically intense thing you do. So whatever a character lets you do is probably going to be the most important part of how those rules react to you. One thing in this that I think is unique to this game system, but it could be in standard Powered by the Apocalypse, I don't know, like I said, like and comment if you want to correct me for the engagement. It's this idea of balance. This is a two-sided conflict that you and NPCs can push you along as part of scenes and story structure. You get to confront these two different competing ideals that are important to your character. This is a really interesting idea, and it's interesting because of how it works and also how it fails. Basically, you have one virtue going in one direction, one virtue going in another. The better you are at one of them, the worse you are at the other. They will give you bonuses if you can show how your behavior relates to them, but they also make you vulnerable to NPCs calling you out on the way that your opinions or beliefs don't relate to this balance. And if you understand an NPC's balance, you can do the same thing to them. You can point out the way that their plan doesn't work, and that can give you advantages to roles against them, and vice versa. This system is really cool, I like it a lot. It is playbook specific, which means that any given character winds up having their conflict predefined for them, but the game also lets you change that if it fits your character better, so I don't really see the problem inherent in that. Now, I at first was concerned that the balance system would be extremely, for lack of a better word, centrist. The idea that there is danger in straying too readily, too far from the center of this balance. And kinda, yeah, but kinda not. So, this introduces limit breaks when you're already at one of the extremes of your balance and you get pushed one step further away from the center, you wind up acting out. You have an eruption of your values. You do something rash that relates to your values, then you recover. This can be detrimental, but it doesn't have to be. It just has to be something that is an inconvenience for you. That's cool. That's I, I can already think of players who would immediately be thinking about how do I push myself to that absolute limit. If you change your balance enough, you may wind up giving up on that conflict entirely because you've clearly made a choice for it. If you opt to trust people so much that the conflict between trusting people and relying on yourself is completely one-sided, then yeah, you don't need to have that conflict anymore. You get to cross it off your playbook. In fact, if you want, at that point you could retire the character if you think you're done with them, or even better, you can move them to a new playbook with a new balance conflict and keep traits and moves you picked up from your old sheet. This is cool and badass because it presents you with a track for committing to an ideal and not just the natural, oh hey, everything is best in the center that I feared it was going to be at first. Basically, in this game, making a choice and committing to an ideal is better than not and it can lend you strength. This also gives every character a deliberate momentum, a feeling that they are always progressing one way or another and trying to make a choice between two different ideas. The huge history section frustrates me because on the one hand, it is structured not as a sequence of historical events on a timeline, but rather as a vision of what it's like to live in a place at a time where being forward or back by a few years isn't actually important but the questions of why are things here the way they are hover about you. It's history as recorded through empathy. It's about the place of the time. It's really well written. I found it really engaging, but I don't think it necessarily should be ahead of the playbooks like this. 
because that slows the player down. But I still really like that section. Similarly, giving you a rundown of the avatar of each era is meaningful because the whole point of the setting is the avatar is the most important person in the world. And odds are good you have an opinion on them. It's the example of a pop cultural touchstone in a world that doesn't have what we think of as pop culture. It's really good because it means that you already have a thing that every character can choose to discuss in the same way that one might, oh, how's the weather? But it has some actual sinew that anchors you in this world. Bending in this setting is methodological. It's one of six different ways that you can represent your character doing things. You can be one of earthbender, airbender, waterbender, or firebender, or you could be a martial artist whose martial practice it puts them on level with benders, or you can be into weapons and technology that put you at the level of benders. It's not a question of power level then, but rather a question of affordance. What can you actually do? Specific examples include if you want to use bending to make a chair, if there is no threat or challenge around you, you just make a chair. And that's nice. That means that this thing gets to be used for expressive behavior without it necessarily requiring a role for every operation as a sort of power hinge for characters to rely on. Something I don't like about that is that your characters who can bend can bend because in bending is an inherent property of some people. It's not stated explicitly whether the bending is genetic, though. I do dislike it either way, but there are ways you can frame it in your game that wouldn't bother me so much that don't feel like they're contradicting the canon. Essentially, all the waterbenders know other waterbenders because waterbenders are the best at noticing other waterbenders. And if there was a firebender amongst the waterbenders, they might never notice their potential rather than no one in the water tribes knows how to bend fire. This kind of works, especially when you're talking about martial technique as a sort of infrastructural technology. People get trained by the communities they're part of and bending is a thing people can do. This is ultimately a vision of the affordances of the game. What buttons does the game let you push? And when you look at the game, what can you see of the buttons that you can push? This game does try and put a lot of that stuff up front, right in front of you. I have been cautious about talking about this game in public because it seems that there's a body of the TTRPG discourse that feels kind of bad faithy to me. There are lots of arguments to be had about the world of a TV series for children made by the company that sells SpongeBob SquarePants that aired from 2005 to 2008, how it doesn't match up to what modern TTRPG creators think that it should. And that feels like a criticism that's easily met with a, so what? I didn't expect a game made in part with the blessing of Nickelodeon to involve seizing the means of production. The game is still modeled on the story it's modeled on, a story about young adults dealing with a world where even the most obvious of evils is only to be resisted, not destroyed. A world where there is a literal chosen one, and where oneness and resistance to desire are important. It's expressed in the game pretty clearly. There's an entire section about not killing, where even though you may be playing your own characters in your own version of the Avatar universe, the game asserts that the characters don't kill. It doesn't close the door on it, and obviously at your table you can do what you like with the swords and guns your characters carry. But it's still written as if player characters don't kill. By default, characters are trapped, imprisoned, or captured. There's always a way out. There's always hope for things. And there's always a point where things won't escalate further. With all that in mind, then, who is this game for? Well, I mean, me. It's for me. It's for me and a lot of people like me who are exactly the kind of dorks who made themselves avatar personas and characters in the world and argued about whether or not it would be okay for another player on the forum to play the avatar considering the importance of that and got into long angry and annoying conversations about whether or not Sokka got done dirty by the story or whether he was a great character or ahem I digress more than that though who is this not for if I was going to level a criticism against this game it would be that this game doesn't feel like it has space for someone who isn't already invested in the world now, that's something that tie-in media can always rely on as an excuse. Why would you buy the Avatar Legends RPG if you weren't already interested in the Avatar setting? From the sense of humor, to the archetypes, to the reference pool, 
The world is full of things that make sense primarily if you're already aware of them from the other media. Is that a bad thing? I mean, in a way, if four people at the table know this world and the fifth doesn't, the book isn't going to convince the fifth on its own. It's not a mind changer, and I don't think that a game is better if it needs a couple of hours of cartoons as homework. But what did you expect? What could you expect of the Powered by the Apocalypse tie-in game to an enormously successful Nickelodeon property? How's it meant to look? It's a pretty book, it's well edited, it's solid in the ways I would want it to be. The thing that confuses me about it is that this game is the most successful TTRPG Kickstarter ever. It raised 10 million dollars. Is it 55 times better made than Blades in the Dark? Is it 200 times better made than Small Affair like Hardwired Island? Does it fight you into its world better, more readily than Brinkwood? Honestly, no? The most damning thing I can say about Avatar Legends is that it's exactly about as decent as expected. It offers me something I knew I wanted, and it's about as good as I'd expect it to be. If I was heavily invested in the TTRPG community on Kickstarter though, I wouldn't hold this up as an example of what to do. Because with all of its advantages, it has just made a good game that meets the standard. It's fine. To damn it with faint praise. It's fine.